Our Father in heaven, um, thank you for the word that you've given to us. Send us also your spirit so that we are hearing from you today, that we are not having human thoughts or hearing human words, but we are hearing what we need to hear so that we are built up in the love and knowledge of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Okay, keep your Bibles open. Just a little bit of background for, for the passage we're going to read today. Um, Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt. That's the story of the Exodus. A lot of you are familiar with, with that story. And so they, they come out of Egypt and they're coming to this promised land. And, and as they approach the promised land, the Israelites have two pretty spectacular, miraculous victories on the way here. Um, I got a map up here, if you can... See the, like the little brown tan area there, and then the green area up there? Um, those were two big kingdoms that the Israelites came into contact with, Og and Sihon, and both of them uh, were conquered. They, these two kings uh, and kingdoms marched out to, to meet the Israelites, and the Israelites defeated both of them. And it was quite a miraculous victory. And so... In light of those two victories there, um, there was a nearby king named Balak of Moab who summons Balaam to curse Israel. So here's kind of the route that the Israelites might have taken. They, they come towards Edom there, and then they go around Edom, and then they come up to right to the top of the Dead Sea there, if you see. And uh, they pass by Moab, where it says there, And that's the kingdom that is really nervous about these Israelites being around. So what's what's going on here? They're they're wondering. So in chapter 22, King Balak of Moab summons Balaam to curse Israel. I'll give you a little bit more about that. In Numbers 22, verse 38, Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that must I speak. And then after this is uh, the story of Balaam's donkey, which is an interesting story on its own. It's in your Bible reading tracks for this week. Check that out. Um, Chapter 23 of Numbers, God gives Balaam a word of blessing of Israel. So Balak wants Balaam to curse Israel, and God instead says, nope, you're going to bless Israel. And so Balaam instead pronounces this wonderful blessing on on Israel. And Numbers 23, 11 and 12 on the screen there, Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have done nothing but bless them. And then Balaam answers and says, Must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? I can't just say whatever I want here. So Balak sees this. He wants to try again, so he brings Balaam to another place. Maybe, well, let's move over here. Let's try it again, you know, because if you just move a little bit, then God will change his message, right? So chapter 23, starting at verse 15, or 13, rather, God gives Balaam a second word of blessing on Israel. Apparently, God is God over here as well as the, the first place. And Balaam says to Balak here in Verses 19 and 20, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot revoke it. (laughs) I can't change it. God has decreed it and that's where it's going to stand. So Balak wants to try a third time. It's like, all right, we've tried twice. Let's try one more time. Okay, so he brings Balaam to a new place. Maybe, this, maybe the third time's a charm, right? Because Balak, Balak is a superstitious guy. So chapter 24, starting at verse 1, the Spirit of God comes upon Balaam, and he blesses Israel a third time. And then verse 10, Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. And verse 14, Balaam says, And now behold, I am going to my people, but come, I will tell you or let you know what this people will do to your people 
in the latter days. And that's where we pick up right here. Numbers 24, starting at verse 15. And he took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir also, his enemies shall be dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly, and one from Jacob shall exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of cities. And then from there he curses a couple more nations too. So, this is our passage today. Balaam is a world famous sorcerer, prophet, seer, diviner. What, he, he could be called a lot of different things. He has a lot of different titles. But he's, he's world famous. Um, you, they've actually uncovered stuff from, from the, the Holy Land with Balaam, son of Beor, on it and some of the things that he said and did. This guy's world famous. Everybody around the world knows who this is. And Moab is going to pay top dollar for this world famous guy to come and pronounce this curse on this nation that is invading his area. So Moab's King Balak thinks that he can conjure bad juju for this imposing horde. Again, Balak, Balak's a superstitious guy. He, he thinks, well, I can, I can have this world famous guy curse these people and then bad things will start to happen to them. It's got to, because this, this guy is the best, right? So he thinks that he can, he can bring some bad juju on, on Israel. Not that we believe in bad juju, but he did. So that's what he's, he's thinking of, of doing. This was kind of a Babylonian thing. The Babylonians at, at the time were, were known for having people who were diviners or expert sorcerers and other things and they would go all over the world and they would do what they're called to do or asked to do um and this this what Balaam does here it fits that that pattern of what we know about what they did okay Balaam repeatedly says he can only speak what God permits and I mentioned just a couple of the times but he repeats this a lot in these chapters Balaam says I can only say what God has said if God has blessed these people, I can't just change that. I am not God, essentially, is what he's saying. I can't just do whatever I want. And this is pretty significant. Here's a world-famous sorcerer. Maybe the best in the world at the time. And he's saying, I can't undo what God has done. If God has blessed these people, I can't curse them. Is no matter how much I might want to, or how much you pay me. There's one point where it's like, even if you give me all of the gold that you have in your whole palace, I can't just do what God has not allowed. And if you're reading the Bible from beginning to end, you probably remember at this time that God said to Abraham about his descendants, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, if anybody comes after you, I'm going to go after them. Just a thought for us here. Um, believers need never fear curses or harm. We don't have to be afraid of this stuff. If there's, if there's somebody who's superstitious, or even... A, a, a witch or a warlock or some sort of magician who, who's angry with you and wants to put bad juju on you of some kind, we don't have to be afraid of that. If God is blessed, nobody can curse. Not even the world-famous Balaam. So how much more some person that we might come in contact with? We don't have to fear bad luck 
or bad vibes or bad juju. Demons, curses, people bent on harming us. These, these things can be real. Demons are real. Curses are real. Be aware of it. Don't be afraid of it. God can't be thwarted. He can't. So we don't need to be afraid. Psalm 27, 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody or nothing. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. So even if, if it was just, just us or just me versus a whole army, I don't have to be afraid. That's quite a, that's quite a statement to make. This is how powerful God is. This is how God brings us peace. <laughs> we don't have to be afraid. Other people, people who don't believe, they have a lot to be afraid about. There's a lot of bad things that could happen to them that who knows what's going to come of that. But for us, like it says in question and answer one that we say a lot around here, all things must work together for my salvation. That's the way God works. No harm can come to us other than what God permits. Can't happen. And any harm that does come to us, God's going to do something with it. I might not know what it is. I might not be able to understand it, at least not while I'm going through it. But God's going to do it. I can trust him. I can trust him. So bad things are going to happen to us, yeah. But not randomly, not because some person has put a curse on us. We don't have to be afraid of these things. We don't have to be afraid. So, let's not be afraid. Let's be at peace. Let's be at peace. Now, verse 17 that we read, it's quite a cryptic prophecy, actually. It's kind of strange, mysterious. It's not very specific. Like, you're reading it, and you're like, what's he talking about here exactly? I'll just read it again. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Okay. Um, so it talks about a star, and it talks about a scepter. So that's kind of code for a king. At least, at least for, for them at that time. So that's suggesting that, okay, he's talking about a king here of some kind. Mentions a star, mentions a scepter. So this suggests a king. Star is a metaphor for a king. And especially when you combine it with scepter. Okay, that's, uh, this, he's talking about a king here. Um, and then it talks about Moab crushing the forehead Forehead is kind of a complicated word. It's, it's kind of like it, it means edges, and so it, we kind of think it's talking about the forehead, but boundaries could be that as well. It's kind of a strange word. But Moab is the nation that wanted Israel cursed. Moab is the one who said, hey, Balaam, come over here and curse these people. Put some bad stuff on them so that bad things will happen to them because we're a little scared of them. And, and then there's this sons of Sheth. We're not even really sure what, who those people are. We're not, you know, there's some guesses out there, but who, who are they talking about? This is kind of a, this is kind of a strange verse. It's, it's not very specific. You know, it could mean a couple different things and okay. But what you can tell here is that um, this shall crush the forehead or boundaries or whatever of Moab and break down all the sons of this Sheth person. We can tell here, though, that the, the curse Moab that you wanted to put on them is going to come back on you. It bounces off them and comes back on you. That's how this is going to work. The, the harm that you wanted to befall them is going to befall you. <clears throat> 
Balak paid big bucks for Balaam to curse Israel, and now the curse is going to be coming on him and his own people. If you are reading the Bible from beginning to end, you will notice that, you know, some books later, centuries after this, King David would come and conquer Moab. David conquers these people when he becomes king. Now, this is a long time later, but it happened. And after David conquered Moab, Moab doesn't really become much of a formidable foe to anyone anymore after that. Um, But David fulfilled that prophecy, or at least he, he did, at least in part. But what is interesting, though, is that when you get to the New Testament, <clears throat> this verse takes on a whole new meaning. This verse, this cryptic prophecy that Balaam gave, is what led the Magi to Jerusalem. That verse is what led the Magi to Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews that was just born. These, these Magi from the east. What one Babylonian prophesied, other Babylonians took notice of and went to see. Let's uh, here look at this on the screen here, Matthew 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, this is fascinating to me. This just, this just kind of, this, just, uh, this is just amazing to me. And Matthew doesn't spell it out for us this way, but he's, he's drawing a picture for us here. And Matthew is saying here is that some far-off pagan astrologers when the, with an obscure prophecy found and worshipped Jesus before the nearby religious scholars did. Jerusalem is full of people who know the Old Testament law backwards and forwards. They know this by heart. They can answer all kinds of questions about it. These are religious scholars, right? And these are fellow Jews, like Jesus was. And who comes to see Jesus or or looking for this, this king that was just born Not the religious scholars, not even Jewish people, but some far-off pagan astrologers. People from far off. It doesn't even say where they're from. They're just way off in the east somewhere. They got it. They figured it out. And they came before all the people who should have come. That's just, Matthew's drawing us a picture here. Now, this doesn't approve of astrology. It doesn't approve of pagan religion. It doesn't say that that's legit or valid or anything like that. That's not what Matthew is trying to say. The Bible widely condemns those sorts of things. But what this does show us is that God can use the most obscure means to lead pagans to the true God. God can use all kinds of stuff, just the most obscure sorts of things, to lead people who don't know the Lord to Him. Just an anecdotal thing. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we are going to be shocked at who we meet in heaven. We are going to be surprised at the kind of people that we're going to come into. How in the world did you get here? <laughs> Where did you come from? I didn't know you were a believer at all. Look at that. When you're saved by grace, you're going you're gonna to have some surprises in, in heaven on the last day. God can use even obscure means like this to bring pagans to the true God. Now, there's one theory of this Bethlehem star that's out there that I think is interesting. And I'm going to just emphasize, though, that this is a theory This is not definitive. This is one possibility. Okay? So you can take it, you can leave it, whatever you like, but this is one possibility. If you want to know more, you can go to BethlehemStar.net. This is where you'd find it. Or uh, hit the next one there, please. 
there's, a, there's actually a DVD about this called Star of Bethlehem, and Frederick Larson is the presenter. Um, he's, a, uh, he's a professor um, in Texas, and he wanted to try to figure this out, and he came up with something that's pretty interesting. So he looked at the text. He noticed that Herod had to ask when the star appeared. So it wasn't some big bright light in the sky suddenly that everyone would have took notice of. This had to have been something that wouldn't have, it wouldn't, couldn't have been a comet or anything spectacular because then everybody would have taken notice about that. In fact, they wrote down when comets came because that usually spelled bad omens, like something bad's going to happen. So they took note of those things. So this probably wasn't a comet, otherwise everybody would have noticed it. So he has this program that you can turn back the clock and see where the stars were at different times and places in the world. And so he did some, some figuring here. And Jupiter is known as the king planet. Okay, It's the biggest in our solar system, right? So it's the king planet, that makes sense. And then there's this star called Regulus, and that's the king star. The Babylonians called it the king, actually. Now, Jupiter passes Regulus every 12 years, okay? In the sky, if you're looking up at the sky, Jupiter, right, uh, Jupiter or Regulus is here. Jupiter passes by it every 12 years. Significant, but predictable, you know? But something interesting happened in the Middle East, starting at around September of 3 BC, the king planet of Jupiter had a triple conjunction with the king star, Regulus. So what that basically means is if, if this is Regulus, if you're looking up in the sky and this is Regulus, here comes Jupiter, and it's going to pass like, like it does every 12 years or so. But this time something happened. Jupiter passes, and then it stops, and then it goes back, and then it stops again, and then it goes over it again. A triple conjunction. That, that catches their attention. Something's going on here. And, and honestly, these are people who look at the stars for guidance and direction, right? So they're, they're, they're taking this more seriously than you or I would. Not that they're saying it's okay to take direction from the stars or anything, but this is what they're thinking. This is where they're coming from. Additionally, Judah, the tribe of Judah, is known as a lion in a number of passages in Scripture, Genesis 49 being one. This triple conjunction of Jupiter and Regulus occurred within the Leo constellation, which represents the lion. And then there's a passage in Revelation 12, verse 1. Why don't you hit that there? It says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. Okay? And this, this Frederick Larson guy points out that the constellation which rises in the east behind Leo is Virgo, the virgin. When Jupiter and Regulus were first meeting, she rose clothed in the sun, and as John said, the moon was at her feet. It was a new moon, symbolically birthed at the feet of the virgin. Additionally, <laughs> on top of all this, Matthew says that the Magi were following this star. It's like, okay, they see this going on in the sky, they know that there's this prophecy back here, and so they think, well, there's, there's got to be some new king that's been born in, in Jerusalem. We better go pay homage to it. Magi were actually also diplomats. So, okay, we better, we better go pay our respects to the new king. It says that the Magi followed the star, and the star stopped. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Nine months after that triple conjunction, <clears throat> Jupiter, the king planet, which is the biggest, and Venus, which is considered the mother planet and the brightest, they stacked on top of one another with a once-in-a-lifetime brightness. Something that happens maybe once every 70 years. And so they were right on top of each other, very much more bright than usual. And Jupiter was in the southern sky from Jerusalem. 
Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. And Jupiter takes this, what you call stopping and then changing course. Jupiter takes retrograde motion and stops precisely on <coughs> December 25, 2 BC, before reversing course again. So Jupiter stopped when they were following it. Now this Frederick Larson guy, the way he puts it is that there's a difference between astrology and, and just astronomy. astronomy. Astrology is when you bow down to the stars, when you do what they say, and you, all of that kind of stuff. But he says, what, what I'm seeing here is that God has kind of written his word into the sky. <laughs> and we can certainly say that God has revealed himself in his creation. It, it says so itself. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The heavens <clears throat> declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In other words, the whole world can see this revelation of God. It just it strikes me how these, these people, they're, they're not true believers. They, they look at the stars and they worship the stars and they, they look to the stars for guidance. And, and God t- took this, this, this obscure thing, this obscure prophecy, and, and showed them the this, this stars. And look, they came to the true, the true Lord. It reminds me of what the Canaanite woman said to Jesus when she wanted him to heal her daughter. She was very persistent. Lord, help me. And Jesus looked at her and said, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. He was trying to get rid of her, and it was a little insulting even. He was basically saying that the Jews are God's people and they deserve the bread. I'm not going to give it to ever somebody else who's not Jewish, you guys are like the dogs. And she responds, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. That's what these magi were doing. They, they didn't have the whole thing. They had some crumbs. They had some crumbs and they found the true Lord. Are you hungry for the coming king? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Are you you hungry for this king, for this Jesus that we celebrate coming into the world in this season? Are you hungry for him? I mean, we're human beings. We need to eat, right? We we do. If we don't... um, you know, we'll start to deteriorate and that kind of thing. If we don't eat long enough, then we'll eventually die, right? We, we need to eat. We know what it means to be hungry. Are you hungry for Jesus? Because there's people out there who are starving and they're eating crumb. So are, are, are you hungry for the coming king? You need to eat. We know what that means. Do you know what it means to spiritually eat? Do you have a reason for getting out of bed in the morning? Do you have a reason to persevere when the going gets tough? Do you have hope when you're going through loss? Do you have strength when you are weak? Are you hungry for this king that is coming? Because he can offer you something that no food can. Are you hungry for him? In fact, I would submit to you that this Jesus that came into the world and is coming again someday, he is everything that you could possibly want, even. Whatever it is that you are pursuing in your life or building your life on, whatever that is, he can fulfill those needs and those wants far more than anything here can. Are you hungry for this king? I sure hope so.
Let's look at the screen here. Why is the Son of God called Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Because He saves us from our sins. Salvation cannot be found in anyone else. It is futile to look for any salvation elsewhere. Lots of people will look to good things in this life, and they will look to them for salvation. Okay? And you can't get salvation out of them. People look for salvation, and by that, even did that by that I mean reason to get out of bed in the morning. Okay? Reason to persevere when things get tough. They will look for that kind of salvation out of romance or children or your kids' success or some sort of validity from your achievements, the corner office that you have, or maybe some award that you've won. People look for salvation in these things. And this is what we believe. You can't find salvation anywhere else. No matter what else you try to eat to give you some spiritual energy, you can only find in Jesus. Only Him. The pagan magi worship Jesus. The king in Jerusalem, who was Herod, he tried to kill Jesus. Most people ignored him. Most people didn't even pay attention. They just went about their day like normal. It's always interesting to me that out of the four Gospels that we have, only two of them talk about Jesus' birth at all. It's like when the apostles started to sit down and write these things down, it's like they didn't have a lot of material to go on about Jesus' birth. I mean, they had some stuff, but not a lot. Most people just went about their normal days. Most people didn't take notice of it. Is that you? Jesus has come into this world to save us, to die on the cross, to rise and ascend again, and he's, come to come, he's going to come again. Are you just going about your days like everything is just regular? Or do you stop and do you take notice? There's, there's a king that has been born. A king who will outshine any president or any other king that we could possibly have. A guy who actually can bring world peace. A guy who can satisfy all of the needs of not only your body, but your soul. That's the king who came into this world. Balaam's prophecy that we read, that a king of Israel would turn the enemy's curse back on the enemy, was technically fulfilled by King David. By the time of the Romans here, when Jesus was born, Moab ceased to exist even. They had disappeared. They had been just absorbed by the other countries around them. Jesus would take this to a whole new level. Jesus would go on to reverse the curse of sin and death. That plagued the whole world. Not only the Jewish people at that time. Jesus took the curse of sin and death and he turned it on itself. Death is reversed. One day all bodies will rise again and sin is gone for everyone who believes and puts their trust in Jesus. By believing in Him, we have this victory and by knowing Him, we understand how huge it is. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, You are the king above all kings, and you have reversed the curse that no one else could reverse. Lord, what has plagued and harmed and just corrupted all of humanity, you turned on its head. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world to be our king and our savior. We pray that each one of us would look to you for our salvation for our reason to get out of bed every morning, our reason to persevere under difficulties, and our source of hope no matter what happens. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.